Hi folks, it is January 26th and we're working on our third snow day at this point. So I hope you've had time to do the scapula and humerus work and review and check your answers via the videos. Uh, it's not an ideal situation but we have to move forward. So today we're going to be progressing onto the lower arm and um, many of you have received this worksheet. If you did not receive this worksheet, you need to go to Google Classroom and print it out. Um, so first thing I want to do is I'm going to look at this section right here and this is going to be the distal end of the humerus, kind of a ghosty humerus up here on the worksheet. And there are some lines here that we need to identify before we progress onto the lower arm. If you remember when we were talking about humerus on the elbow end, I said that this area is going to make a lot more sense once we add the lower arm in and that is going to definitely hold true. So take a second and try to identify the parts of this humerus right here and they're going to be the same as the ones that I covered on your last video on the humerus. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and write in some of these answers um, and maybe change the direction of this first, this arrow right here. So this section right here, I'm going to draw my arrow that. This bump right here and this bump right here are the medial epicondyle. So I'm going to write M epi. Maybe I should type this, it might be faster. Um, so we're looking at a right arm here from the anterior view and a right arm here from the posterior view. Let's go ahead and say this is anterior view and this is the posterior view over here. Okay, so they're pretty close together. That might be a little confusing. Same thing for the lower arm, anterior right arm, posterior right arm. What else do we got? Well, we've got these two fossas here on the anterior side. Remember that the radial fossa will always be lateral because it will match up with the radius bone, which is going to, you can see how they've drawn lines here, match up with the radius bone down here. And this is going to be the coronoid fossa. And that's going to match up with the ulna. Okay, so that's a little shallow indentation there. And another one right next door that's quite a bit smaller. Underneath those two parts, we have the capitulum. I'm just going to write cap, maybe. And that will articulate with the head of the radius, so there's the capitulum. And this double bump right here that's spool-like, also seen from the posterior view, is the trochlea. So I'm going to write a T right there. And I'll go ahead and outline that so you can see it a little better. Trochlea, and from the posterior view, Trochlea. And it looks like we just have one left here, which is this larger single fossa on the posterior view. That is the olecranon fossa back there on the back side of the humerus. So just about there. Okay, those are important. So I think I'm going to keep this information here um, so we can kind of understand how this is going to work with the lower arm. Um, okay, so let's tackle the radius and ulna. First off, we have to figure out which one's which. So let me scroll down so you can see the whole picture. We've got bone A and bone B. And again, it already tells you anterior view right arm, posterior view right arm. So um, moving back up, the radius bone will always be positioned laterally and this is going to be letter B on the page. So let's go ahead and write in a letter B. Maybe I'll use my text, that'll be faster. Letter B, need to make that smaller. And the ulna on this picture, both pictures will be letter A. Okay, bone B, bone A. So here's the radius, here's the ulna. Now I'm guessing at this point that perhaps you could even go ahead and guess which parts these are because we've seen the majority of these before, I think. Yes. So for the radius, usually it's usually the proximal end of the bone, not always, but usually the proximal end of the bone is known as the head. So the head of the radius is going to be here. Let's see if I can get that right over there. Okay, and also on this side as we turn to the posterior view, here is the head of the radius. Right underneath the head is usually a narrower portion that uh, supports the head known as the neck and so that would be this section here 
and then on the radius there's this bump right here it looks kind of like a belly if you have this is your head this is your neck then this is, would be your belly and that is known as the radial tuberosity um, some people will call it the biceps tuberosity because the biceps muscle attaches there so that you can move your forearm and we'll talk more about that when we get to that chapter so the radial tuberosity is going to be there and in terms of coloring I think you can probably get the head and the neck but just in case the head of the radius at the top here is this sort of disc shaped section and it looks to me like a smarty candy sitting on the top of the radius it is round like a coin um, and sort of indented and I don't know if any of these views at the bottom this one gives you kind of an idea this would be the head of the radius in this view and you can see it from the posterior side again different views here okay so kind of a little smarty candy if you know what smarty candies look like which I'm sure you do the neck is just underneath it this area here and the radial tuberosity is going to be this roundish bump which depending on the angle you're looking at it can, it's pretty obvious the radial tuberosity we just get a little hint of it there but it's much more visible on the anterior side and it kind of faces the ulna all right last one for the radius this is going fast the styloid process is going to be all the way down on the distal end and remember the styloid process of the temporal bone was a pretty sharp projection so this pointed area here is the styloid process not so much viewed from the posterior side maybe you give it a little like this but it is a sharp projection on the distal end of the radius and that's going to meet up with these carpal bones here along with that part pretty easy okay let's move on to you know what I'm gonna jump down to this other list and then we'll finish up with the ulna today um, other interosseous membrane well we know inter means between and so this whole section here is a fibrous connective tissue that holds the shafts of the radius and ulna together so on both sides yes there are some um, openings in it to allow certain um, structures to pass through it but this is the interosseous membrane. So I'm going to write IOM. These are my own personal abbreviations just to save time. Interosseous membrane. We're going to see that again when we get down to the lower leg between the tibia and the fibula. And we have two important joints the proximal radio ulnar joint and the distal radio ulnar joint. And so these are represented by this circle shape. So remember, a joint is where two or more bones meet. And in this case, where the radius and ulna meet, right here is this area where the radius can spin around to create this kind of motion of the hand. That's the proximal radial ulnar joint. I'm going to leave off the word joint. And then I imagine you can understand that it's also right there. And guess what? The distal end has the distal radial ulnar joint where these two bones are going to articulate or form a joint with one another. Distal radial ulnar joint. Lovely. Okay, and let's finish up with the ulna. Remember the ulna? Ulna is a little trickier, unfortunately. So I think maybe, hmm, it's getting kind of messy. What I'm going to do is erase all this, hopefully you have it, and let's just look at the ulna by itself. Um, the ulna has these four parts, let's do them perhaps in order of difficulty, so we'll start with the styloid process of the ulna. If you look, here was the styloid process of the radius, this is the styloid process of the ulna. So as you can imagine, it is going to be important for you to distinguish between the styloid process of the radius and of the ulna and of the temporal bone because we have that more than once. Okay, so that's going to be this little tip right here. And this little tip right here. And if you look at your wrist, um, 
like on the back of your hand and look at your wrist. On the pinky side, there's a bulge on the forearm. That's the area of the styloid process. Um, kind of the distal end of the bulge. Actually, what you're seeing when you look at that bump is this area right here. Okay, so we did that one and the rest of it is on the proximal end. Now, the ulna is a little bit of a tricky bone. And I have one here. Let me dig in my little bag of bones that I brought with me. Unfortunately, it's very three-dimensional and kind of hard to show you on the um, computer. So, I don't know if I can turn my camera on now since I've started but maybe I'll go ahead and find a picture of it in a little bit. Let's do the coronoid process next. So the coronoid process is going to be right there. And so I'm just going to abbreviate that CP. Coronoid process. We do not see it on the posterior side. Now, let me show you where to color. This part of the ulna is actually a pretty sharp peak, and I know it does not look like it at all on this flat diagram, but it's coming straight out at us. And when we put these two bones together, this entire chunk is going to go behind the humerus, and the coronoid process will fit into the coronoid fossa when you bend your elbow all the way so that you can bend your elbow all the way. Um, the next one that we need to take a look at is the trochlear notch. And this is probably the most difficult, so I'm going to go ahead and, I think I'm going to go ahead and outline it first. Do I get a red? Now, this is a notch. We know what a notch is. It's a pretty significant cutout of bone or a concavity or an indentation, but more significant than a fossa would be. And the trochlear notch, as you may guess, will fit precisely with the trochlea, which has this sort of double bump. So there's a ridge that runs right down there in the trochlear notch, and you have to imagine that this is all cut out. To me, it reminds me of an ice cream scoop. So when you're coloring for the trochlear notch, we're going to color something like this. Okay, and all this is indented. Now if you look in the PowerPoint, you'll see a nice view of the ulna from the side. So you can see that it really looks like an ice cream scoop. So I'm going to write trochlear notch and leave it right there for this red. And understanding that it's going to fit with the trochlea. It's going to match up perfectly with this. So when you bend and straighten, bend and straighten, we have a hinge joint that forms between the trochlea of the humerus and the trochlear notch of the ulna. So finally we have the olecranon, which is such a great word. I'm going to use yellow. The olecranon, we see a tiny bit of it here, but this is essentially the outside portion of the scoop. And as you may guess, it is going to fit into the olecranon fossa, which is up here when you straighten your elbow. So let's see, I'll just put Olecranon, Olay. That's that, and that would be the Olecranon fossa. All right, let me show you the PowerPoint. I'm going to switch gears here. I think we did everything on this worksheet. Aha, perfect. So this is the view of the ulna from the side, and actually, let me find another picture here. Back up. There we go. This is all articulated. Here's the humerus. Here's the medial epicondyle. Here's the trochlea. Here's the capitulum, lateral epicondyle, radial fossa, coronoid fossa. Here's the head of the radius. It articulates with the capitulum and the radial fossa. So what you can remember is this whole series of parts right here. The head of the radius wears the cap. Cap for capitulum because you can wear a cap on your head. The head of the radius wears a cap and fits into the radial fossa when you bend your elbow. The coronoid process, this little tip right here, will fit into the coronoid fossa as you bend your elbow. And the trochlear notch, which we can't really see because it's covered, will articulate with the trochlea. So let me go back to that original picture that I had. Let me 
find it here. Here's a view of the ulna from the side, from the lateral view. We've taken away the humerus, which would sit here. Trochlear notch would fit right into there. And you can see it's covered in blue. That means articular cartilage because we're forming a joint. So the trochlea of the humerus would occupy this position here. The head of the radius would occupy this position here. And when we get back in class, whenever that is, I will teach you how to differentiate between a right and left ulna, right and left radius, and we'll go over the humerus as well. You really want to look for that, um, it's called the radial notch, which you can see a little cutout right there. All right, I hope that, um, let me show you one more picture. Let's see if I can zoom in here. Um, of how these parts will fit together. So when we put the ulna on the humerus, essentially this entire trochlear notch portion will not show because it'll be posterior to the trochlea. It'll fit together like a lock and key. And then remember the back side, they hit this a little misleading, the back side of the top of the ulna, the, the proximal ulna is called the olecranon. So when you point your elbow or you know, when you look at your elbow point, that is the olecranon of the ulna. And then you can see how the head of the radius is going to articulate right here with the ulna, and that would be the proximal radio ulnar joint. Okay, folks, uh, next lecture is going to be on the um, lower arm, wrist and hand.